How's everybody doing this morning? I'm excited about this day. You know, we get to go to church. We don't have to go. We get to go. Isn't that wonderful? I was looking forward to coming this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can open them. Or you can use a pew Bible. It'll be a Luke 15, verses 1 through 32. So during the next few weeks, I will speak on a subject that we as a church family or a congregation, as some people say, need to consider again. Messages that deal with our purpose. Your purpose and mine. Our purpose. Why we are a church. And why God has called us to do the things that we are to do. Remember, God's called you to do something. Now, I don't want you to be confused and think that this is a what we believe series because it is not that. Yet it is true that because of what we believe, we do the things we do. But what have we really been called to do by God? Jesus answered that very question by saying in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. If you want to turn there, you may, but I'll read those to you. The ones I underline real bold in my Bible. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, that's the Great Commission. Our marching orders if you please. I call them my marching orders. So the first part of our purpose as a church is to go and seek the lost. Tell them about who? Jesus. And try to bring them to Jesus. And I am convinced that when we recognize that that's the reason we exist is to reach the lost with the message of Christ. Then, as a congregation, as a body believer, as a little country church, we will grow. That's how we grow. Now, in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, our scriptures for today, the verses for today, there are three parables there that illustrate the importance of spreading the good news about Jesus. I'm sure in my heart that you all know these parables, so I'm not going to read them to you this morning, but just remind you of them again and summarize some of the things that these parables teach us. But first realize that Jesus told them in response to a criticism. You see, the Jewish rulers were criticizing him about the kind of friends that he had. They said, if you are who you claim to be, then you wouldn't be spending your time with these characters of society. You would be spending your time with quality folks like us instead. So in response to that, Jesus tells these three parables. He begins by saying, if you were a shepherd and had a hundred sheep, but when you came home at night, and counted them, discovered that you had only 99, what would you do? That's the first parable. Right? What would you do? So if you were a good shepherd, let me tell you what you would do. You would go out and search for that lost sheep, right? That's what you do. You would search the rocks and the ledges until you found it. And when you found it, you would put it on your shoulders, and come home rejoicing. Then next he says, suppose you're a woman who loses a valuable coin. What would you do? I'll tell you what you would do. You would light a lamp and move the furniture. You'd go through every nook and can, cranny in the house until you found it. And when you found it there, would be a celebration, right? You're called 
Follow your neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, I have found that which was lost. Then Jesus goes on with another parable. Suppose you're a father and you have a rebellious son who demands his inheritance right now. Reluctantly, you give it to him and he goes into the far country where he wastes it all. Finally, he finds himself in a hog lot eating the slop that has been put out for the hogs. Then he comes to himself and says, I'd be better off as one of my father's hired servants than to be here. And he goes back home. Sound familiar, that parable? He'll go back home again. As I said, you're familiar with these parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and a prodigal son. But I want you to realize that Jesus told these three stories to teach people that he had come for one primary purpose, to seek and to save those who are lost. That was his purpose. So let's draw some lessons from them. First, let's understand why we seek the loss. Why do we? And secondly, let's look at how to seek the loss. And then thirdly, let's see the reward of searching. So first we have, why do we seek the lost? Why do we seek the lost? Comes to my mind all the time. Why? You see, it is possible for us to do the right things for the wrong reasons. For our reason... For wanting to reach out to the lost is simply to build a bigger church? Is that why you're doing it? Or to stroke our ego? Or can we brag about what a great church we have here? Then that's wrong if that's the reason. And we need to re-examine our motives. Why do we seek the lost then? See, because they're lost. And still in their sins. They're lost. They're still in their sins. Just as we once were. So the love of Christ compels us to reach out and share. And share. And share with them the good news of God's wonderful love. And of Christ's offer to forgive them of their sin. And make them a part of the family of God. Let me ask you. Now, that's your question. Have you ever lost something valuable and searched hard for it? Have you ever? A preacher friend told of a great wrenching time when he couldn't find one of his twin grandsons. The names were Christopher and Michael, and they were close to a year old. Christopher seemed to be a contented type child, and he would play quietly by himself for hours and hours. You might not even realize that he is anywhere near. But on the other hand, Michael, well, Michael's different. Michael's very vocal, quick to express his feelings. If he is unhappy, he lets you know about it. If he doesn't like the food or the things just aren't right, he is very vocal and loud about it. So you almost always know where Michael is. Well, anyway, one day the house got strangely quiet. Whenever the house is quiet and Michael is in it, something must be wrong. So my friend started looking for Michael. He, it wasn't too concerned at first. He just walked through the house saying, Michael, Michael, where are you, Michael? Michael, where are you? There wasn't a sound around. There was Christopher. He was playing quietly by himself, but no Michael. So he continued looking through the house calling, Michael, Michael, but still there wasn't a sound. Not a sound. Suddenly all kinds of horrible thoughts began to swirl through my friend's mind. I mean, what if he stuck his finger in an electric outlet? Or what, what if he had fallen into the toilet? And then he remembered that the garbage that he was taken out. And he thought, well, maybe Michael got out the door and is calling around outside. He quickly went outside and searched all around, but no Michael. Finally came back in the house and got down on his hands and knees, and he started crawling around on Michael's level. 
looking around behind doors and in closets behind the furniture and calling constantly, Michael, where are you? Michael, hey, Michael, where are you? But there was not a sound. And then he crawled into the dining room and he discovered Michael under the table, eating something that had fallen off the table. It was crunchy and Michael must have thought it was a whole lot better than the cereal he had been offered earlier. And as my fanatic friend told him, and then looked at him, oh, Michael, he just grinned. So he picked Michael up and says that he was nearly in tears as he said, Michael, don't you ever do that to me again. And later when he reflected on the incident, he thought, when was the last time I mean, really, when was the last time I searched that diligently for someone who is lost from God? When? You know, Jesus looked at the crowds and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, wandering aimlessly in the world. So he came to be their shepherd and to lead them safely into the fold. See, and that's what we have been commissioned to do, you and I. That's what we're commissioned to do. Secondly, how do we seek the lost? But now the second thing I would like you to see is that these parables are the ways of finding the lost. What ways are presented in these parables? See, first, if you think about the parables, first, there is searching. When a shepherd lost his sheep, he went searching for it. He went out and looked and looked until he found it. And when the woman realized she had lost her coin, she went looking for the coin. So searching, remember this, so searching is the very first method. We need to search for the lost. By the way, I don't know whether you noticed or not, but there is a difference between these parables. The first parable, the sheep was lost out there, but the coin was lost in here, in the house. There are people out there for whom we need to be searching because they are lost. We need to do whatever is possible to find and bring them in. See, that's the reason Jesus took time to talk to the woman at the well. That is the reason he called Zacchaeus down from the tree. That is the reason he spent most of the night talking to Nicodemus. And that is the reason one of his final acts on earth was to speak to the thief beside him on a cross and say, Today, today you shall be with me in paradise. I don't know if you know Terry Brads. He was 25 years old. He lived in the middle America and was pretty much caught up in a lifestyle of middle America. His five-year-old son was invited by the woman who lived next door to go to a VBS, vacation Bible school, with her. And he went. And at the end of the VBS... The little boy invited his father, Terry, who was not a Christian, to come to the closing program. And Terry went, just like we have at our church. We invite the parents and friends to come. As he watched the program, the Holy Spirit began to work on the father. It took a while, but gradually there was a change in his life, and Terry became a Christian. Not long afterwards, Terry Brad's enrolled in seminary, and today he is a preacher. His son, Greg, who was five years old when he was invited to VBS, grew up and became a minister. Also, his youngest son studied for the ministry, too. All because, when you think about it, all because one lady in the church, one lady, took time to invite a five-year-old boy to attend vacation Bible school. See, we need to be searching. We need to be looking But there's a second method presented here. 
You see, the shepherd went out searching, the woman went out searching, but the father stayed home. He didn't go to the far country, did he? It may not have done any good to go into the far country looking for that son and find a prodigal son and drag him home. He needed to come home on his own. So what did the father do then? The father made a home so appealing that the son wanted to come back. Do you catch that in that parable when you read it? He wanted to come back. So in one respect, we search, but in another respect, we attract. We need to make the church so warm and appealing that people want to come. Whenever there are prodigals out there in the far country, they need to know that the church is a place of love and acceptance where there'll be warmth, where there are people who will understand and reach out and minister to them. We talk a lot about that in our church, to welcome people. We don't care what they look like, how they dress, what they're doing. We want to show Christ's love. The third thing is the reward of seeking the lost. See, finally, there's the reward. And the reward is rejoicing. When the prodigal son came back home, the father said, quick, remember the text? Quick, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his finger, bring in a fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and a celebration. For his son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. That's in Luke, if you looked at our text, 15, verses 22 to 24. So when the shepherd found his sheep, he told his friends, what neighbors, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. And Jesus adds in Luke chapter 15, verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And, goes, and, and when the woman found her coin, coin what did she do? She called her friends and called her neighbors and said, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. See, again, Jesus adds, In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner who repents. Now listen. If it is that important to the angels, how much more important it should be to us as we think about our friends, our loved ones, who are outside of Christ and lost. Have you thought about that? I think about that a lot. So does my wife. We look for the lost. My wife just spent speaking four clubs, son? Four four clubs for women down in the Albany area. Why would we travel there back and forth? She's looking for the lost who need Christ. Are you doing that? Is that what you're spending your time doing? Anyway, Larry Bryant had a sermon about how the angels rejoice in heaven when a sinner came to Christ. And he wrote these words down that I've saved. I want to read them to you. At the completion of the Golden Gate, no, the angels did not celebrate. And when the Wright brothers flew their bird, no angelic shouts were heard. There's only one thing that we are sure about that can make those angels jump and shout. It's when a sinner makes the Lord his choice. That's when the angels rejoice. When a light bulb first lit up the town, no, the angels did not dance around. And when the Model T first hit the street, it didn't bring all heaven to its feet. When the first man stepped on the moon, they didn't sing a victory tune. And when the first computer was born, they didn't blow old Gabriel's horn. See, there's only one thing that we're sure about, 
that can make those angels jump and shout? It's when a sinner heeds the Savior's voice. That's when the angels rejoice. See, my thought is this. If that's true of angels, it should also be true of our little country church here. Our own lives. I think it is reason the time of invitation is important because the decision to make could affect you for all eternity. There may be a lost one right here. Has anybody here searched them out? You see, as Christians, we can search and we can attract. But finally, it comes down to your own decision. The doors are open. We're ready to rejoice with you if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I challenge those who might not have Christ as a Savior. Please accept them into your life. It's simple to just ask forgiveness of your sins and say, Jesus, come into my life. I want you as my Lord and Savior. And from this day forward, you admit that you are a sinner. You ask Jesus to save you, and he does. And then after that, there is a day rejoicing. Not only yourself, but all the people you know, you rejoice and tell them what has happened to your life. So my challenge for us as Christians and claim Christ as Savior, how about going out this week and look for the lost? Or how about talking to the Lord and he'll probably point out people you already know who are without Christ. And what did you do? Nothing. Nothing. And they're still lost. And what if you got a call the next day that that person that was on your mind died? You know, I talked to the Lord a lot and I said, Lord, I'm really worried about I get to heaven and you ask me, well, who did I bring with you? Well, who did you bring with you? I say to you this morning, who did you bring? Who did you share Jesus with? That's really what life's about. The lost. Father, we thank you for your time and your parable and your teaching this morning. Lord, may it be on our hearts wherever we go, wherever you send us. You have a plan for us and you made it so clear in your word that we should be searching the lost and bring them to Jesus Christ. So we all can celebrate and rejoice. And then we can celebrate in a little country church together, sharing your love and singing to you and praising you, Father. So I pray that's our challenge. That's what's on our heart this coming week. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.